<laughs> Father, we just thank you for Helen. Thank you for corner of life. Thank you for the gifts you've given to her, Lord. Thank you for the amazing insights she brings often in unfolding your word. We pray tonight as we look at Galatians, maybe a real sense of the spirit of truth guiding us into truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Well, good evening. I've been asked to speak on Galatians 1 and 2, and I'd love to read the whole thing to you, but um, it would rather make our time long. So I'm going to read the first, um, I don't know, 12 verses or so. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Am I trying to please men? If, it was still, if I was still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I may preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you, before God, that what I am writing to you is no lie. This is the word of the Lord. On July the 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped out of the lunar module onto the surface of the moon, the first people in history to do so. Their achievement that day was the culmination of a phenomenal series of human developments that went back for centuries. From those ancient peoples who first came up with a way of denoting mathematical symbols, through the ancient Greeks who developed geometry, through those Renaissance thinkers who invented higher mathematical methods, to those who took the mathematical principles and used them to develop computers, and that's just the maths computing side. Then there's the materials side. Consider the scientists who learned how to create materials that could withstand extremes of heat and cold, enormous pressure differences, materials that would reliably duct fresh air in and body waste out. We could go on. Putting two humans on the moon was one of the most extraordinary scientific and technological achievements that we have achieved to date. And it was all done with the power of human reasoning and logic and invention. Of course, God made the human mind in the first place, but then humans got on with the job of discovering, thinking, designing, calculating, and inventing. And so we should. 
We're designed to do just that. Because reasoning from the bottom up can take us to unknown places. It took us to the moon, and it may one day take us to the stars. But it will never get us to God. After all, when the first astronaut, Yuri Gagarin, returned from his successful inaugural flight in space, the USS Premier Nikita Khrushchev said this, Gagarin flew into space but didn't see any God there. Reasoning upwards from first principles is a brilliant way to reach the stars, but it will never take us to God. Think about it. We might arguably, very arguably, be able to reason about the existence of God from the raw data of the world around us. Some would say so, others would say most certainly not. But we cannot possibly draw any conclusions about the character of God from the world around us. We cannot reach an understanding of the way of salvation. And we have absolutely no hope of being able to come up with the person of Jesus. Let's face it, it's utterly unfathomable. It's beyond human logic. Who could reason from first principles that God would become a human? Who could deduce that he would win a victory over the grave through allowing his son to be crucified? Who could possibly reach the conclusion that through the death of the son of God, the whole of creation would be made new? Who would ever discover by logic or reason that the broken world would be not just mended, but made utterly new? Not you or I. Not the best scientists or philosophers or even theologians. Reasoning upwards from first principles is a brilliant way to reach the stars. But it will never take us to God. These are things we can only discover by revelation from God himself. These are things that can only become clear to us, to the human mind, if God chooses to tell us. This is not bottom-up reasoning, it's top-down revelation. In his prolonged opening to the letter to the church in Galatia, and we only read about a third of it, the Apostle Paul is very concerned to emphasize this point. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any human source, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Why? Why is Paul so concerned to make that point? Well, backtracking for a moment, it might be helpful to explain the background to the letter. Paul's writing to the church that he established in Galatia, which is modern Turkey. His was the first mission to the region, and he brought to the gospels there, brought to the Gentiles there, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of salvation through faith in the Son of God. Now, after Paul left, some teachers followed him, well-intentioned, no doubt, but with the purpose of tidying up the mess that that rather slipshod church planter had left behind him. And in particular, they were concerned that these Gentile converts could not just leapfrog their way directly from pagan religion to Christianity, but they must come via the Jewish faith. They must convert to Judaism, become circumcised, observant Jews, and then they could be good Christians. And when Paul heard about this, he was livid. Make these Christians start observing laws they had never known of? Outrageous. And this letter is written in these circumstances and out of his anger, and I hope you hear it, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is no gospel at all. Now, it's generally regarded as poor form to speak too much about yourself when you preach. And likewise, it's probably equally poor form to write too much about yourself in a letter giving advice to the church. 
But Paul doesn't seem to have read the style guide. Because out of the first two chapters of Galatians, 28 verses are autobiographical. That's well over half of the first two chapters. 28 verses talking about his conversion and the early years of his ministry. We heard some of it, but not all of it. Why? Uh, Perhaps Paul's like one of those celebrity writers who fill the bookshelves in W.H. Smith's with titles like My Story So Far, or A Life Worth Living, or The World As I See It, or Catherine Hepburn's classic simply titled Me. Well, I don't think so, and here's the clue. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a different gospel, other than the one we preach to you, let that person be under God's curse. This letter isn't a passionate account of Paul's misunderstood early years. It's not even a passionate defense of Paul's ministry, not for its own sake. It's a passionate defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Why is the gospel worth defending? Why is it so important that Paul calls down rhetorical curses on anyone who deviates from it? And here's the reason. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any human source, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And then for the next 28 verses, Paul shows us how he didn't reason it out for himself and how he didn't receive it from any other human source either. This is not something he made up or that Peter and James made up. It's not a story cooked up by the early church. It's not a carefully reasoned logical argument. It's not based on a series of deductions. Because if you could sum up Paul's view of the gospel in six words, I think those six words might be, well, I didn't see that coming. Well, I didn't see that coming. Paul didn't see it coming. He quite literally didn't see it coming. He was a devout Jew, passionately opposed to this new Christian cult, and on his way to Damascus with papers from the Jewish authorities authorizing him to imprison anyone he found there in the city who was practicing the new religion. And there, on the road to Damascus, he encountered a bright light. A bright light that would illuminate the rest of his life. A light that would burn ever brighter as the years went on. And a voice, a voice which rang in his ears forever afterwards. I I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting, and I appoint you to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Well, he didn't see that coming. And so Paul is utterly, absolutely convinced that this gospel, this good news story, is not of human origin. I mean, who could have made it up? Certainly not him. Let's think about that a little longer. In 1962, the scientist Thomas Kuhn described a phenomenon that nobody had previously put a name to. He described how the normal business of science goes on from day to day in labs around the world, and then suddenly someone makes a discovery, a discovery that changes everything, that makes people go back to the drawing board and start thinking about things differently. And Thomas Kuhn called this a paradigm shift. So it was a paradigm shift when the theory of phlogiston, you didn't learn that in GCSE chemistry, was overturned by the theory of chemical reactions, which you probably did. It was a paradigm shift when the theory of ether waves was replaced pretty much overnight by the discovery of electromagnetic radiation. It was a paradigm shift when the Newtonian theory of gravity and forces was overturned by the Einsteinian concept of relativity. Those are all paradigm shifts. But of course, all those paradigm shifts happened by bottom-up reasoning, by the careful, thoughtful, ingenious application of observation and reason and logic. But the paradigm shift that took Paul by surprise did not come about by human logic. It came by direct revelation from God himself, because no one could have seen it coming. 
And I wonder if perhaps God was having a bit of a chuckle when he decided to appoint Paul to receive this revelation. Because someone less likely to be receptive to that paradigm shift you could not imagine. So what are these paradigm shifts? What is this tremendous change? What's this extraordinary good news that nobody could have deduced, least of all Paul? Well, there were two things at least two in particular, which Paul comes back to again and again and again with wonder and awe and, quite frankly, with astonishment. And the first one is this. We are justified. We are made right with God, not by keeping the law, but by faith in God, by the grace of God. Chapter 2, verse 16. We have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Who saw that coming? Well, maybe at a stretch, some Gentiles might have done, Gentiles who'd never obeyed the law of God, who'd never really thought about it. They might not have been that surprised to hear of salvation by grace through faith. But for Paul, a devout Jew who had always kept the law, always loved the law, who understood that the law was there to help him to live God's way, who viewed the law as his friend and his teacher, for Paul to say that the law cannot make us right with God, for Paul to say that it is faith in Christ, not obedience, that will save us, well, who saw that one coming? There's a paradigm shift if ever you saw one. And it certainly didn't come about by reason and logic and human ingenuity. Because if it had, Paul would have resisted it tooth and nail. No, this was top-down revelation. This was revealed by God himself. And then there's the second paradigm shift. The second thing that drives Paul to his knees in wonder. And which stirs him so much that his worship spills over into his letters. What is it? This, Gentiles as well as Jews are being saved. Well, who saw that one coming? Paul had grown up as Saul, a Jewish son of Jewish parents, taught in the synagogue every week about his special status as a Jewish man. How the Jews were the people of God and everyone else was an also ran. How one day that God would send a deliverer, a king, an anointed one, a Messiah to save his people and Saul would have eagerly watched and waited for the coming of that Messiah, the one who would save the Jewish people and kick out the Gentile invaders. And then, and then came that blinding moment on the road to Damascus and everything came into astonishing, overwhelming focus. And Saul became Paul, and Paul received the commission to become apostle to the Gentiles. What, God had a purpose for the Gentiles as well, the dogs? God loved Roman soldiers too? God sent his son for Gentile as well as Jew? The Messiah came to save not just the Jewish nation, but the whole world? And the church, that glorious infant creation, which was God's way of showing this new reality to the watching world, the church was made up of Gentile and Jew. Not at odds, not fighting over the color of the carpet or the style of worship, but Jew and Gentile together, both in equal need of God's salvation and both co-heirs with Christ. Who'd have seen that coming? Certainly not Saul, the devout Jew. I think God was having a laugh. And it certainly couldn't have been reasoned out by human logic. No, this crazy, counterintuitive, countercultural idea could only have come from the mind of the divine master. It isn't derived from bottom-up reasoning, but from top-down revelation. And Paul was to spend years pondering on those two great truths, saved by faith, not law, Gentile and Jew together. 
And incidentally, thinking hard and reasoning about them, making logical argument about them, because they are robust enough for that. They aren't some airy fairy spiritual cloud that puffs away and you blow on it. They aren't a dew that evaporates with the warmth of the dawning sun. No, these paradigm shifts are robust and tough and can be interrogated, thought about, tested against scripture. Yes, although nobody saw them coming in the Old Testament, they can be found there, or at least their seeds can. And I think that's what Paul is doing when he went away to Arabia for three years after his conversion, thinking and reading and praying and reasoning it all out, making sense of it. But it came first by direct revelation from God. And Paul was going to spend the rest of his life wondering at those great truths, and his wonder overflows in worship and praise in his letters. No doubt it overflowed in his teaching and his preaching too. Saved by faith, not law, Jew and Gentile together. And it's interesting that those two things which were the least natural to him, those two points which were the most unexpected from his starting point, were the two things that Paul seems to ponder most, that drew him most to worship. Perhaps when it is when God is most mysterious to us that we are drawn into worship most profoundly. So what are we to make of these two chapters, you and I, in the 21st century? Well, notice this. For Saul, the strict Jew, the radical anti-Christian campaigner, for him to become Paul, apostle of the Gentiles, it took not only a direct revelation from God, but a heart and mind that was willing to receive it. A heart that was willing to think God's way, even when that was completely unexpected. Even when it shook his world and challenged all that he held dear. It took a willingness to take God's word for it. Because repentance involves a change of mind as well as a change of heart. Much later, Paul wrote this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. In other words, open your heart to the revelation of God. Expect the unexpected. Don't always try to reason up from the bottom. Allow God's word to surprise you. Allow his spirit to change your mind as well as your heart. But how do we guard against thinking that every new weird idea is the leading of the spirit? After all, there's nothing about novelty that makes it definitely God's idea. How do we know? Well, we've been given the Bible because God does not contradict himself. He may surprise us, he may catch us unawares, but he does not change in essence. That's why Paul went and studied for three years. Was this new revelation really in line with what he certainly knew of God from the Old Testament? And when he reread it with humility and an open heart, he discovered that it was. So what do we do? We check it out with scripture. We can always learn more from the Bible. We can always grow in our understanding. We can ask new questions of it and think new thoughts from it, but God will never contradict himself. And then, with that holy habit in place, be prepared. Expect the unexpected. Live in a state of readiness. What new thing might the Spirit be saying in our day? But no this. The gospel was given by God. It is not for us to change or tweak it. We do not have the authority to water it down or to beef it up. We may not place boundaries around its outrageous grace, but we may not remove the stumbling block that is the cross of Christ and the call to repentance. Because this gospel was not invented by clever people reasoning upwards from first principles. 
That's a brilliant way to reach the stars, but it will never take us to God. The gospel is the revelation of God himself. God has spoken. Are you listening? We've been listening, breathing, taking that in. One of the, the challenges that I want to, to leave with you as we, as we go back into worship is a little bit about your own paradigm shift. What was it that changed for you when Jesus came into your life? How did your thinking change? And are you still walking that way? Because one of the challenges for the, for the Gentiles is this business of not being able to stay with that, that new paradigm that, that has been talking about. And, and I, I guess for me, one of the, one of the things that, that I, I'm not trying to preach another little sermon on the back of, of, of Helen's, but I'm struck by the call that God has put on his church really for the last hundred years or more to be a church that rediscovers the work of the Holy Spirit in powerful, dynamic, now ways, as well as savoring all that we've received from the, the history tradition of the church. And um, the Pentecostal movement at the start of um, the 20th century was a paradigm shift, actually. For, for the context, the people that was the dominant idea at that time was that the gifts of the Spirit, they're not for now. That was there to get the church off the ground. In America, that was probably a dominant idea. It took a whole shift of thinking. And for us to stay in that place where hmm, we hold on that, that, that's quite key. And, and I think it's for me, actually, because it's easy for me to not be led by the Spirit because sometimes the old ways are easier. The handling, the doctrine. You know, John Wimber is one of my heroes. And John Wimber, who um, really kind of led the church into a whole new way of thinking about healing and about every, everybody getting to be involved in healing ministry. He said when he started thinking and teaching and writing, there were no books on the subject. It just wasn't out there. There was nothing on, 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 on the kind of the charism and healing and prophecy. Now, if you go to a kind of Christian bookshop, I suppose that stuff's everywhere, you know? There has been a paradigm shift, but what, what are we living in? What, what are we living in today? So as we go back into worship, um, let's take a moment to think, God... What have you said to me that's come by revelation? And am I still believing that? Am I still walking in that? And as we um, just allow that reflection to bubble up in a kind of coming back to God with, with thanks and wish with me. As we go on through Galatians, we'll be thinking about this whole life of the Spirit that we're called to walk in. But that life of the Spirit is here for us today. And today I want to encourage you, if you need to... Again, give your life over to that spirit who blows where he wills, the one who brings revelation that we can't just deduce. If, you, if, if God's been speaking to you about some of the risk-taking, then we'd, we'd love to pray for you and encourage you to, to step into all that God's saying to you.